Okay. Well, hello. It's is it is it a bit late now to say Happy New Year? Um, anyway, Happy New Year. Lovely to see uh, many of you who I've met in person or online. Yeah, I'm Jem Bendel. For those of you who don't know me, and this is a a Q and A for an hour with me. Um, opened up to participants in the Deep Adaptation Forum. So we're going to be talking about Deep Adaptation for the next hour. And of course, it's a very, very big agenda. Um, I've asked the senior facilitator of the Deep Adaptation Forum, Katie Carr, to host us for this hour. Um, so Katie will, will kick off with the first question. Okay, good, right, I'm going to start then. Um, so as uh, someone who I know and have been working with closely for the last couple of years, working on the topic of societal disruption and collapse for a while now, uh, maybe you could start by telling us how you've been feeling. Hmm. So my feeling right now, apart from the nervousness of suddenly doing a Q and A, um, and possibly that's also because I'm not used to any more standing in front of people because uh, of the what's happened in 2020. Um, it's it's gratitude and wonder at the kind of people that uh, have come into my life over the last two and a half years, um, and the way that people show up on this topic because of. Uh, this topic and the way that they're choosing to respond to an anticipation of collapse by being open-minded, open-hearted, wanting to explore together and see how to um, be useful at this time. Um, so yeah, um, restoring my faith in human nature. Uh, I, I feel that yeah, I, 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 it's been wonderful to realize how people are showing up with this anticipation of collapse in a way where they want to be useful and helpful and curious and open hearted and collaborative. And that's been wonderful. So that's been a big thing. Uh, how else have I been feeling? Um, some overwhelm at the amount of things that could be looked at and worked on. I have a story of self of being intellectual and wanting to be useful um contribute to the conversation and it's a huge conversation touching on psychology sociology politics economics climate science uh, food security all sorts so there's a bit of an overwhelm and therefore also a frustration that that working on that has sort of crowded out just um the implications of my awareness for my own life so therefore to be more present with people I love. Um, more recently, I've had sadness. I think initially it was defensiveness and then I that, let that go, but then it would, what remained was sad, sadness about some of what I perceive as somewhat of the misinformed, inaccurate, and sometimes aggressive uh, criticisms of me and deep adaptation now that it's become way more uh, widely discussed. Um, and and I think maybe like with everybody, I've been feeling in the last year some confusion and vulnerability because of the pandemic. And then also because of the pandemic policy responses uh, and you don't know how that's gonna go. You don't know how the, the backlash to those is gonna work out. You don't know how bad it's gonna get, what with uh, public and pri private debt, unemployment, big mental health crisis coming our way because of it. And though perhaps my work in deep adaptation has helped um, me be ready to witness all that and know it's good to talk about it rather than suppress it, um, that's still with me. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Jim. Um, could maybe talk about, pick up on that with the pandemic. Um, what do you think we are learning from the pandemic and the responses to it? Um, so I'm an environmentalist and have been for since my first job in 1995 with WWF on deforestation. 
And one of the very um, minor things that was talked about back then was how deforestation uh, can lead to uh, more disease, uh, zoonotic disease um, from animals. But it was a, it was like a, a narrow area. So with that background, I've been slightly outraged at the lack of discussion, both within the environmental movement, but also just in the mainstream realm of public health or policies on, on COVID-19 about the connection between environmental degradation, including climate change, and the likelihood of outbreaks of zoonotic disease, including COVID-19. And therefore, um, you know, even the UN has confirmed that environmental degradation, including climate change, has made uh, the coronavirus pandemic more likely. I mean, of course, it's in a hyper complex systems, it's impossible to say, so this particular event caused this, caused this, and therefore it's definitely been caused. But um, the analysis is such that it may, we, we can at least say it's made more likely. Um, so I'm annoyed at that, about the lack of discussion, because what that means is, um, we're more likely to see zoonotic disease outbreaks again and again and again because of uh, damage to the environment and because of climate change. Um, uh, I think also, I also wonder therefore, as societies destabilize, will people make the connections back to environmental degradation? And therefore, will they begin to question how we got into this mess? Will the opportunity for learning be lost um, because if you make those connections then you have a, a conversation about with a very deep critique of industrial consumer society and then you can even go into critiquing modernity and you can start to explore how we might choose to respond differently without repeating the mistakes of our culture that got us into this mess so there's some anxiety there about lack of connection leading to lack of inquiry leading to perhaps knee-jerk inappropriate responses in future so that's the downside the upside perhaps is we've seen the a lot of mutual aid we've seen a lot of people desire to do the right thing and accept personal hardship in order to do the right thing um and that that i hope can be respected and nurtured and not abused by possibly the increasing rise of sort of authoritarian surveillance culture. Um, we've got to be working hard at uh, making sure that human rights are upheld and that we also resist the shrinking of the space for um, informed dialogue about what are all the different policy options when faced with a pandemic like this. We seem to see quite a lot of polarization into just follow what you're told on the one hand and not even question corporate power and how it might be influencing agendas. And on the other hand, going into the realm of conspiracy um, where you kind of just go around in circles and, and, and there's no real collective progressive agenda coming out of those conspiracy theories. Um, I, th I see that the pandemic in some countries may be turning into societal breakdown and even one that we don't bounce back to the 2019 normal won't be back again so looking back on it it might be seen as the, the the start of widespread collapse and i think that's also perhaps why people are more ready to have conversations about anticipating collapse now um, in all walks of life um, so that's something that that it seems we people are ready for. And of course, that's creating a bit of a backlash as well. Thanks. I'm going to ask Claire very shortly, but I just wanted to um, stay with this. And I heard you talk about the responses, the out there, big picture responses. Um, you touched on uh, polarization and the risk of increasing narratives of uh, around fear, but I'm curious if you would share with us anything that you have learned about um, your own like 
emotionally what's been happening over the last nearly a year um maybe connecting that with with what you've written about with individuals responses within uh, within deep adaptation but specifically how that has played out with with how we're responding emotionally individually okay, yeah yeah um so when i said that maybe my engagement with what we now call deep adaptation may have helped me personally with the difficulties of the last year um i have become not only more aware but almost or more actively engaged in the noticing of my inner world so i've had waves of anxiety that are also even held expressed in 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 the body i wouldn't say as far as panic attacks but um but in the ways that i haven't ever had before in my life and um my response to those has been to be able to witness it um, and and know that it's best not to just act from that and not try and escape that emotional difficulty with whatever story I'm hearing um, will seem to help. So that story might be vaccine will fix everything, we'll get back to normal, or that story might be Bill Gates is trying to inject nanobots into my brain to turn me into the, some sort of blood smart Microsoft system, or I, I don't, sorry, I don't keep up with all the theories. Um, you know, but just to, no, I'm feeling a bit vulnerable, anxious, confused. I'm used to always planning ahead. I'm used to always having, I know what I want and my plan B will be this. And now that seems, well, I know that that just doesn't work now. Um, and I'm, I'm learning to be a bit more okay with that and meet people in my confusion, pain, vulnerability, and so on, right? and have conversations about it. I learned that through the deep adaptation work prior to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic kicking off. Thank you. Yeah, I have the same memories of March last year, feeling so very grateful not just for the, the support and the relationships that I've got within the Deep Adaptation Forum, but the ways in which it has already contributed to, to my own emotional resilience. And there's faces on the screen who I'm thinking of when, when I say that out loud. Um, so I want to go to Claire next. Um, I can't see you on my screen, but can you unmute yourself and put your video on if it's not already on? Shall we ask also people to introduce yourself? as well when you when you speak yeah sure okay um hi everyone i'm claire uh i'm the media coordinator for xr uk um and one of the founders and my uh question that i've put in says uh, what are your thoughts on the increasing criticism of activists and intellectuals who advocate for collapse anticipation and societal disruption to be discussed and also uh the the thrust of anti-doomism <laughs> which I've become very interested in. Yeah, hi, Claire. Thank you. I was pleased to see you talk about that also with um, the climate scientist P Peter Kalmus, um, someone who isn't shy to actually talk about how, what a bad situation we, we are in. Uh, yeah, so I'll stay on the theme of inner work. Um, and I've said this before, I've learned that even if um, that it's not personal, even if it seems it's personal. And so um, it's natural, I think, for me or anyone when to get when to hear criticism, particularly if you think it's inaccurate, misguided, misleading. Um, or worse, um, it's natural to feel defensive, some anger, some and, and, and you maybe even get a bit self-righteous and aggressive in return but it's important not to stay in that like okay wow that's how i'm feeling and then and then not act from that place um because it's natural that people are getting upset hearing this info i remember when i first heard of dark mountain um which are a group that well, 10 years ago were talking in the same way uh i was annoyed when i heard about them i immediately thought um well they're just giving up and enjoying themselves writing poetry um I had that that feeling. I remember it well. Um, 
but I also realized that part of it was that they were scary. And I think George Monbiot wrote about it, that actually, you know, they, they're scary. And so that's where a lot of people are at, hearing this info and hearing that other people are taking it seriously and spending time on it can be quite frightening to some people. Um, particularly if people believe in reform, if they believe in technological solutions, uh, if they believe that you should preserve this society that we know at all costs, then they're going to be particularly disturbed by people like me and us talking about this and to say that it's too late to avert disasters disrupting our society. So the first thing is the inner work, because this is not going to get, uh, it's not going to become an easier, calmer conversation as more and more people talk about collapse and more and more problems are happening and more and more people are experiencing disruption in their own lives or seeing it on their screens around the world. Um, so yeah, how to engage, that's why with the Deep Adaptation Forum, we talked about in main, the principles being engaging with uh, compassion, curiosity and respect. And we also talked about returning to that, knowing that we'll slip our way from that. So that's probably the first thing. The second thing is probably not to disengage with the people who say, yeah, what did you call them anti, the anti-doomism, like saying bad doomers, um, giving up um, and uh, upsetting our children, that kind of thing. Um, but I think it's important not to disengage entirely uh, and then look at their arguments. Um, so they're saying we're wrong on the science um, and we're also counterproductive. Those are the two main su substantive things. And uh, when anyone is making an argument, which is different from ours, you say, well, please explain yourself on your side. So rather than throwing accusations about, well, just say, so tell us uh, clearly uh, how, uh, how do you respond to these published papers in peer reviewed journals that are saying that uh, the that even the latest models are showing that if we stopped all carbon emissions now, um, we would go through two degrees. And then um, tell us how that in 2009, all the top climate scientists, including some of the so-called anti-doomer critics, they, they published something called the Copenhagen Diagnosis, saying that unless emissions are peaked by 2020 and are coming down significantly, uh, we will blast through two degrees and it will be catastrophe for our civilization. Um, it's, it's, uh, what is their evidence in terms of when we look at, since the Kyoto Protocol, decades of action on climate um, while emissions have risen? What's their evidence about how we're going to uh, achieve the change? Um, and also, how will they refute um, research that shows that, so for example, food security modeling which shows that um, within three years of uh, global ambient warming of 1.5 degrees, we are very likely to see a multi breadbasket failure. And then the knock-on effects of that will be massive. So it's, we're not wrong, we have differences of opinion. Uh, and people who anticipate collapse have looked at this and concluded differently to them and believe we should have a conversation about this. And so that's not a marginal view. I mean, the, the scholar's warning letter that came out just before Christmas now has over 568 signatures of uh, scientists and scholars from over 30 countries around the world saying, we can't keep shutting this down um, as a conversation because then we lose time to actually see, well, what can we do to try and reduce the harm with increasing disruption, breakdown and even collapse? The other thing is they're saying we're counterproductive. Well, again, it'd be like, well, um, what's your evidence for that? Because we have evidence um, that actually it's not counterproductive. Um, you, Claire, know from all the people you work with. I mean, you say, maybe you could tell, tell us. Um, a lot of people who realize that we're in an emergency situation where now we can no longer believe that somehow we're going to fix this there's no fairy tale anymore in environmentalism. It's just going to get bad. It's a question of how bad is it going to get and what can we do to help slow that and, and soften the, the, the landing and do as much as we can to find meaning and joy on the way and hopefully plant the seeds of something. Of course, some people don't believe that's, that's possible, but um, it's certainly not. We've even done research of members of the Deep Adaptation Forum. We did a survey and over, it was about half, 
say that since they anticipate collapse and have joined the forum, they are leading what they consider to be leading in their communities in new ways. So um, we have some evidence that it's not counterproductive. However, if they've got evidence that it is counterproductive, then it's important to see that because not because we stop the conversation on collapse, because we also have opinion surveys showing that a lot of people now anticipate collapse in the next 20 years. So it's about how can we have the right kind of conversations to help people move away from a bunker mentality of it's us against them, whoever people choose to define as us and them. And so for me, deep adaptation is offering a different way of engaging with that. Um, so, um, but also a third thing would be, don't just get lost in those arguments. Um, because it's beyond climate science. This is hyper complex. It's, it, it involves all other areas. And we need to be clear about what our agenda is. In, in your case, Claire, with XR and activism. Um, I think for deep adaptation, it, it does invite the question, what is our public agenda rather than our personal one? And how public is our public agenda? And do we have a strategy to impact at, uh, at a political level? At the moment, I don't think we really do. And I think that's been fine and appropriate. The focus of deep adaptation conversations has been on the interpersonal. Um, but I think it may well be time now to start having a, a chat about that. And maybe therefore there'll be more opportunity for explicit connection with Extinction Rebellion and other activist groups, perhaps. What do you think? Thanks. Um... Well, yeah, one of the things that I felt really strongly is that like a part of this conversation goes to saying, um, you know, if, if, if you're going to dash people's hope, then you're the problem, you're driving a wedge in the movement. Um, and um, I'm quite interested in, the, in, in, in that as an argument, um, which as, as far as I can see, there's a bit of wedge driving going on. It's not come from me. <laughs> or you <laughs> so the aim to sort of bring people together to get people to take action and to do work together that helps either themselves their community or the wider movement all of the work that we've got to do seems to me uh that we have to be able to tolerate these kinds of uh different levels that people get to in their awareness of um of, of what the risk is and um and i've also sort of obsessed about risk quite a lot um because i feel like one of the re one of the major reasons why uh, I think um, climate scientists alone have not um, been able to to uh, alert people to what's really at stake is because they're not risk experts, and so they very much want to create communicate truth that as, as much as they can find it. And if there's something sort of that can't be measured or that's not very well understood, then often it's just omitted from the conversation. And of course, if you're looking at something that's hyper complex and you reduce it in that way, you're, you're, you, give, you give information that's like, has huge lack of, of, of things that people could really do with hearing. <laughs> um, so um, there's something in all of that, which I'm not quite, I'm never quite sure whether I've got to the bottom of it or not, but I think it's, um, I think it's really important. And I don't, um, I don't think that I don't think that I know anybody basically who's a who's a, a, a doomer. Um, I feel like the people that go to to a place of you know inaction and head in the sand basically don't don't understand. <clears throat> people who do understand yeah, this I, stuff can't put it down once they know. I'm, they have to <laughs> live with it. Yeah, I've if I've ever met anyone who say climate change, oh, it's too late, don't bother. Uh, I, actually, they were never really engaged and um, and they don't really realize what it means for them and their loved ones, because you can't be blasé once you really take this to heart. Um, so, so, yeah, I haven't met anyone who truly believes uh, it's too late to prevent catastrophic damage to our societies, including even in our own lives, and then just turned away um, I know that there's cognitive dissonance increasing and I had it in me for years as I thought, well, maybe it's too late to stop these, this massive damage and disruption in, and in my own lifetime. I didn't know how to talk about it. Uh, and so deep adaptation is, an, is a route out of that cognitive dissonance. 
but some people don't want to go there because they fear the despair in the same way I fear the despair. Um, um, so yeah, uh, recognizing it's painful and therefore staying compassionate even when people are saying that you're just somehow influenced by Russian bots spreading misinformation and whatever the latest nonsense attack is against uh, people like me. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Um, I want to go to Eric next. Uh, he's got a question which connects with some of what you've just been with touching on. Uh, um, hey, this is Eric coming from Vermont in the United States. And the question that I had was, um, you know, for those of us who are communicating this message, and I'm a university professor and I sometimes talk about this kind of stuff with my students, uh, usually by their own request, not so much because I bring it up. Um, I guess the question I have is, is what obligation do we have as communicators for those of us who are to present this in a way that does not push people over the edge with respect to mental health? And then what are some strategies that you can offer or uh, that you know of that might help with that. Thanks. You're muted, by the way. Yeah, thank you. So, um, firstly, I would say, Eric, um, recognize how painful the topic is and therefore how difficult it is to bring this to people um, where you think it's going to be new for them. When I say difficult, difficult for you and me to bring it to people authentically um, and how it should stay difficult because the, I had it at one, one or two talks I gave or one or two interviews where I was a bit rushed and I, I was a bit numb, I think, to the topic. And as soon as we start just, oh yeah, some data ABC, therefore collapse, da, 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 da. You know, here's a model. Let's just, you know, it, 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 it's, it's reducing the, the gravity of this topic. But of course, it's difficult to get fully emotionally connected with that gravity of, uh, all the time. So the first is to recognize that and therefore pace yourself. Secondly, so I don't do many talks like this. And also this is, my first, I think I did a Facebook Live, um, hmm, September 2019. I don't do, yeah. So there's that. Um, secondly, um, I'm giving a talk uh, that uh, Professor Ina, Ho Ho, who's on the uh, call, um, is organizing. So I'm giving a talk to an adaptation conference, but I was when we were planning it, I was asking, so who's gonna be coming? And, um, and I said, I, I can't do it unless there's attention paid to the context and the support for the people who will engage with me um, on this. Uh, and so there's going to be a session after my talk, which will be about um, uh, sharing about emotions and providing support. Um, that's not, I mean, it, it's, it's online, so that's not ideal. Um, but the thing is, is that um, awareness of this topic is spreading. And so the opportunity for people as a cohort of students, for example, to talk about this, hear about it from someone like me and then talk about it with each other is way better than just news of it being shared uh, in, a, in a quick dramatic news bulletin. I, I've avoided mass media for that reason. I just thought it would be ridiculous for it to just land in someone's living room as they watch telly in an unsupported environment. So I focus more, that's why we thought about creating the Deep Adaptation Forum to learn about these issues, about how to hold space on this. Um, so those are the first two things. Um, I, I also, in the context of the Deep Adaptation Forum, although I'm not directly daily involved anymore, uh, since I've left the, the team, um, we're quite clear that 
we need to spread means of emotional peer support throughout society because we're going to have a massive ma mental health crisis spreading and we can't just rely on professional services to do that however it's really important that all of us know where professional services are available and point people to them and also reach out for them ourselves so for example that's one of the reasons why the guidance database was created and launched as one of the first projects with the forum and that's also why the uh, moderators on the Deep Adaptation Facebook group know about uh, how to point people to emergency mental health support. Um, so, but I'm interested, Eric. I mean, you say you, you, you've been doing talks about this or um, um, how have you been approaching this, this issue? Um, and in a, because there's one way of going, which is just sort of almost bureaucratic and and that's not good enough <laughs> you know let, yeah. let, let's see how we can really be helpful well kind of like i alluded to i don't necessarily like schedule talks on this topic uh, but i do teach at the university of vermont and a lot of different classes and it is uh normal for students at some point in the semester oftentimes multiple times during this semester to start bringing up issues of climate collapse and the many political and environmental and social consequences that they will have. And I'm the instructor of the class. And so naturally they turn to me and, and want me to, uh, you know, they want to bounce ideas off of me to see if they're being irrational. They want help working through their cognitive dissonance, which is a huge issue. And then it's pretty normal nowadays, at least among the kind of students that I have, for probably half of them to rely on some kind of uh, medications in order to stay functional because of mental health issues. And it's also typical for maybe a quarter of them to have like significant mental health crises during the course of the semester. And so I have to point people to the resources they need so that they don't kill themselves, which is a, a ongoing fear of mine yeah. Not necessarily because of things that I present to them, but just because of the stuff that they see when they turn on the news. Um, yeah. So I don't give, I don't bring this issue up, but I'm, I try to be there for the students when the issue comes up and try to, I don't even, you know, I, I wish I had a strategy that I use that I could report works, but I feel like it's individual to each person. Like some people, the best I can probably expect to do is calm them down. Others, they're in a place where we can have a talk about the details and that we can like pick at their cognitive dissonance. It just, it varies so much. Thanks, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, and I know that you've been doing a lot of work around uh, trauma and taking that into account and becoming trauma aware in these conversations. Um, Thank you, and thank you for for the heartfulness that you that you're bringing to this work as well. I would like to go to a question from uh, from Ina next, which is kind of bouncing from this this very personal place up to a a, a bigger picture. Ina, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, following up what Jem just said, um, um, of course, the, the context uh, differ quite. Oh, yeah, let me introduce me first. Uh, I'm a professor in social spatial planning at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Um, I think the context and the awareness on deep adaptation is quite different in, in, in countries and in different cultures. And um, in the Netherlands, I see uh, even in the mainstream media, uh, the last two years, uh, really a rapid increase in awareness of the uh, severe impacts of climate change. So I think uh, there's a time now to reach more out to indeed to students and, and the public about these issues. And um, I'm therefore also quite pleased that uh, Jem agreed to give a lecture on uh, next Friday during the Open University in Groningen. And it's an um, and for the others, I just put a link in the in the chat because there will be much more activities uh, this week also um, on on adaptation. 
and uh, which you can follow. And there's also a conference on the youth climate movement. I think it's especially important to also reach out to the youth, but indeed in a careful way, uh, deep adaptation can create sense of urgency, but can also create uh, stress. So therefore we indeed followed up this presentation with Jam on Friday with a session on the emotional responses to, uh, to this predicament. Uh, however, my question is more political. Um, so it's um, following up the, your article in Open Democracy, where you address seven points of critique in a very clear way. I was thinking um, how to create a more concrete political agenda uh, following up the four R's, uh, especially around issues like restoration, innovation, a shift to a post growth economy. Um, yeah, also um, about how can it include aspects like a radical communitarism perspective and also how can we include guidelines for governance? Um, so how to support a more bold governance direction, including a revised financial system? What would be your thoughts on that, on the concrete political agenda of the um, deep adaptation uh, group? Yeah, um, thank you, Ina. And uh, Professor Hollings is one of the signatories of the Scholar's Warning, which calls for more active engagement of this topic uh, by all kinds of scholars with a view to developing that policy agenda. So, yes, I agree. Uh, now that the anticipation of collapse is spreading around the world as particularly more people experience disruption, destabilization, vulnerability, confusion, unpredictability in their own lives. Um, uh, if, if we don't reach out and talk to them about how you process that, then certainly other people with other agendas will do and arguably are doing. So arguably the rise of the right, the rise of, uh, um, so-called populism, but really um, nationalism and so forth, is, is trying to take that sense of malaise and annoyance. It's, it's, not, it's not by chance the popular phrases are like make America great again or take back control. This is about based on a sense that the future doesn't look very good anymore and we're annoyed at the present. Um, and in other countries, there are similar sentiments and similar catchphrases. So yeah, unless we reach out and show uh, that there's another way of responding to a sense that the future is not going to be great um, uh, in the old way of understanding great. So not great in terms of materially, not great in terms of uh, what you may have thought your future would or your kids' future would have or be. Um, then people are going to fall for the narratives that they're being told about who to blame and where safety lies. And that will be counterproductive. We could see um, quite aggressive foreign policies uh, being justified. Uh, we are already seeing dehumanizing narratives within the environmental movement. Um, and, uh, and it means, I'm about to say something which some people, for example, may find controversial, but it means we have to be okay about having disagreements within the so-called environmental movement and the so-called deep adaptation movement. So for example, some people like to talk about overpopulation. Uh, and yet, uh, it's very easy for any of us to uh, learn, for example, Oxfam just had a report out which reminded us that the richest 1% of the world, uh, their carbon emissions um, account for more than double the poorest half of the whole planet. So um, if, we, if we have an overpopulation problem, it's within the 1%. <laughs> and, and, um, and so actually the, the narrative of overpopulation, uh, you know, where, where are there too many people? <laughs> Uh, and uh, and it could lead to therefore sort of this a callous narrative of oh well there's too many of us at just at a time when we need more solidarity humanitarian uh, commitment and support and a an, an new internationalism 
in the environmental movement and in general uh, as we face this crisis. Because, because it's going to be natural that the, the, the bunker mentality is not, it's not just going to be people building bunkers, it's going to be seeing their towns, their country, uh, their identity, their race even as, a, as some kind of bunker, us and them, and I, I believe we need to point that out and challenge it and show a different way. Um, and part of that will be to show how the environmental disaster occurred because of the same things that lead to that kind of racist othering of people, which is, is you, you, you sort of, you deny the, the subjectivity and the, the, the full sovereignty of every other living, living being. Um, there's this constant separation of self. And it's because of that that then we can tolerate colonialism uh, destruction of nature, racism, patriarchy, and so on. Um, so the articulating the depth of that critique will hopefully invite people away from sort of defensive um, mentality as they feel fear. But also we need to spell out, spell out, as you say, a coherent policy agenda. Yes, I think it's about time. And yes, there's an opportunity for a systemic critique because decades of effort of reforming capitalism have just coincided with incredible uh, species loss, habitat loss, climate destabilization. Uh, so there's just no credible evidence for continuing a reformist agenda. And we need to start talking about, well, what is a radical transformative agenda? And, uh, in terms of the objectives and the methods of getting there. And so you mentioned finance, and yeah, I've been doing quite a bit of work on that. And, and um, the banking and monetary systems do encourage, uh, encourage and even require economic growth. And some research has debunked that, and actually that research, we believe the people I'm working with, the economists, was incorrect. And there is actually a monetary growth imperative for the nature of our monetary system. And therefore, if we're serious about trying to uh, have bold mitigation and also uh, transformative and deep adaptation, then we have to uh, show a pathway to an alternative monetary and banking system. Um, so it is time for that. Uh, and I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be working on that more this year. Um, and I really hope, and I think that's what the scholars warning indicates. There are many more scholars who are saying from all walks, you know, climatology, but economics, politics, psychology saying, I'm ready for a really difficult new conversation about well, what, what's needed in society. And therefore potentially there'll be many more people to work together on a, on a policy agenda. Um, so I'm up for it in my little way, my little part of that. Great. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Ina. Um, I want to invite a question from Zareen now, which yeah, connects with, with part of your response just now, Jen. Zareen, can you unmute yourself? And while Zareen is unmuting yourself, just a moment to remind anybody who's got a question that's just burning to be asked there's still time and you can post it in the chat box please thank you thanks Jem. you've already touched on some of the things i was flagging up so i'm calling in from elite just outside of cambridge in the uk and i'm coming um, from a non-scientist perspective from my work as a coach and a facilitator within the uk civil service and the corporate sector and a newbie within DA. So much of the work is about somehow engaging minds and hearts, attracting people to do the tough work that is needed and create the new system we need. So within that context, I ask, um, you mentioned current system uh, institutions of economy, culture and politics that suffocate the potential for real transformation. And yet new structures tend to get institutionalized and reflect the existing colonialist white supremacist paradigm. What do you experience as working well within DA that can help in our quest for change wider afield 
in our myriad of ways. You know, I'm not going about it as an environmentalist or a scientist. So we're all doing it in our myriad of ways. I see a lot that's working well within DA and I want to know what you see. Yeah, so thanks, Zareen. Um, I want to start with where you ended, which is that, yes, uh, the experience of societal disruption and collapse and the anticipation of societal disruption and collapse is not an environmental thing. Um, it's in its economics, politics, psychology, organizations, communities, um, and our own inner worlds. And also uh, acting to try and reduce harm in that context is not just at all an environmental thing. Um, there's a huge role for religious institutions and uh, humanitarian groups and uh, coaches and uh, organizational leaders and all kinds of um, so yeah um, you're right it's um, it's a much bigger piece than just talk and so it's important not just to get stuck in the environmental uh, conversation and argument um, what do I see working you've also talked about how you see um, that we continue to see structures being created in this society that reflect uh, the ideology of this society. And you summarize that um, in terms of a colonialist way of being. Uh, and I suppose we can see that then when people get together to do th things about the environment, uh, for example. So what's working well in DA? I was, I was really pleased to see uh, one of the things that came out of the strategy options dialogue last year of volunteer led dialogue on what should deep adaptation be working on as a international community um, was decolonization and diversity to actually look at this and also to not just about how can we be more inclusive um, but also what can we what can we learn about these topics uh, and how might we as a community change for example it's because of that and the initiative that's emerged as a result of that um, strategy options process that now i'm asking myself what could i learn about uh people who've been through tragic disruption of their own way of life and who also feel that, that their sense of identity is coming from a culture, uh, is part of a culture that has been uh, disrupted, oppressed, destroyed. Um, and also I'm thinking, oh dear, I don't actually know. So I'm, I've existed within a culture that um, is limited. And therefore my engagement with what is a global problem is reflective of my culture um, and therefore it's limited. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I wanna be open to learning uh, from that. Um, I realize it can be quite painful for some people to recognize that because um, it gets confusing. Like you, you, you begin to lose a sense of solid ground um, in terms of, you know, what my worldview and, and my blind spots and so on. But it's important and it's difficult work and it's the broader decolonization anti-racism and and the co-liberation agenda which is important to deep adaptation because we are trying to reduce harm as societies come under stress and begin to be encouraged to to blame each other or blame the other um and psychological theories like terror management theory point to how when people get more stressed, they can also become more attached to their existing stories of identity, safety, security, belonging. It, so unless we're active in, in inviting people away from that, which I think the decolonization work and deep, deep adaptation is active in inviting people away from those responses, um, then if we don't do that, then, then what are we doing? What are we really doing here if we believe in reducing harm? Um, I mean, I believe I, I believe all the the practical deep adaptation, you know, uh, 
delinking from the capitalist system and growing your own and, and, and becoming more resilient in your local community is brilliant. And it's not enough. Uh, that can't be a turning away from the broader social justice agenda. Thank you, Jem, and thanks, Zareen. Um, I want to go to Yuri next. Uh, if you're ready, Yuri, to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, uh, it's great to see so many people over here. And uh, what, what strikes me is that, uh, according to the World Economic Forum, about half the population, world population is younger than 27 years old. Um, uh, well, you know the World Economic Forum yourself quite well. And I have the impression that um, the majority of us over here are just a little bit above 27 years uh, of age. Um, so I was wondering, um, how could we, what, what could we do to pull in more young people into this discussion? Uh, because it's their world too, after all. Yeah, thanks, Yori. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's important and I'm, I'm not directly involved in the Deep Adaptation Forum in the way I used to be. So I don't know where the forums got to on this issue, but I do know that we all took it very seriously and wanted to be deliberate and careful uh, in the way that we would engage young people. Um, I have, for me, it was really important. So I reached out to say Caroline Hickman and, and um, who's a child psychologist. And there's a video on that, which I recommend when I interviewed her. Um, and, and she, in her work, we're talking with young people around the world as part of a research project about anticipated climate disruption and even collapse, was that they, they've already been having the conversations themselves and they've already been processing it and got lots of ideas. And so as adults, we need to be open to hearing and talking with, not talking to, children and young people and that was my experience i was blown away when i went to a school to talk to young people so blown away i made a film about it it's called it's called oscar's quest and it's uh, talking with children about collapse and um what i realized was that young people it's like okay this okay all these adults are arguing amongst themselves about who's right who's wrong who's responsible who's irresponsible blah 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 but it sounds like there's a real possibility even probability that this is the future that i will live in much more than they have to so what am i going to do about it um so there's much more of a okay so what uh energy that i hear like an immediate processing and then so what so um so i think it will be very uh it would be it's important to engage young people and i'm not doing it i don't think the deep adaptation forum is doing it but katie you might be able to update me on that um and it has to be done very very carefully because it, it's it, all different age groups there are different issues and different contexts different backgrounds different support structures in the family and at school it's got to be done very consciously with some resources uh, to make sure that it's done as well as possible um but I, I, um, I'm not working on it myself and um, I don't know where the forum's at on it. Katie, you can come in there if there's anything to say. Yeah. We, we, and Yori, if you've got ideas as well about what's really important to keep in mind, please share. Um, yeah, just in response to that, Jem, uh, no, we're not. My, my background is working in, in education with children and young people. Um, and it seems to me that right now, um, it seems that it isn't part, necessarily part of the function of the Deep Adaptation Forum. However, it could be a place uh, to support um, adults, parents, teachers, other people who do work with children and young people to uh, explore the best ways of having those conversations, the best ways to support them rather than deep adaptation be a place for uh, drawing young people in. Yeah, it doesn't feel like that's quite the right fit at the moment. I think it's important for the 
climate movement, uh, the, the adults in the climate movement, to uh, engage young people on this. Um, if not deep adaptation, then to engage people on uh, young people and children on adaptation. Uh, there need to be as many uh, demands on government and business and leaders uh, for emergency adaptation uh, to climate disruption as there are demands around mitigation and, and net zero and so forth. And at the moment, the Fridays for the Future movement and uh, other children's and young people's um, activist movements, uh, I don't think are talking about adaptation. I think it would be uh, good to have those conversations. Um, it doesn't need to be about anticipated collapse or deep adaptation. It's just the broader piece of, of trying to reduce harm with we know what some of what's coming. Can I, can I respond, Jam, as you asked me yeah. to respond? Yeah. yeah. Um, it was what I, I, uh, I've lived in Finland in my life, earlier on in my life, and um, I went to a former host family where my host sister, when I met her at first, like she was four years old, but now she had grown into like a 19 year old. Um, and we talked about how things were going there at high school. She was in her last year of high school. And I asked her and her boyfriend who was there, so what do you think on climate change? And are you talking about that? Are you discussing it? And uh, to the surprise of her parents, who, with whom she never really talked about it, it was like, yes, we talk about it. And, and do you worry about it, I asked. And both of them said, yes, every day. And we can't sleep um, at night uh, because of it. And that, that, um, that fear, that, that conscious fear and that the unconscious fear as well, that was there and that was constantly bothering them. And what I have noticed is that it's really good to open up, uh, open up such a discussion. And I have been discussing it with many students at some universities where I guest lecture. Um, and I just address the issue and I, um, I don't say like I confront them or I, I go all in and that's not how I do it, but it's, it's having a frank discussion and, and talking to them as equals. Like, hey, you know, what do you think we should be doing? And if you take them serious and if you treat them as adults and I, well, you know, I think you can have a very meaningful discussion. And even youngsters who said, yeah, you know, yes, I've heard it, but I, I never believed in it. But hey, after this talk that we've had uh, for three hours, it's like, gosh, it's far more serious than I had realized. So even for some people who weren't in there, but just to, to, to get everybody to talk about it for once, to open it up as a okay topic to discuss, I felt that really did a lot of good work. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Yori. It's um, nearly every question that's come in is exactly on this topic, but, but for different, uh, different audiences and different purposes is how on earth do you talk about this? Uh, so thank you for bringing for bringing that one on in. Uh, I'd like to go to Alex next, please. Alex, if you want to unmute yourself, please. Sure. Thank you. Um, so glad to be here and to spend some time with you, Jan and Katie and everyone. Um, Alex Diaz, I live in Puerto Rico, um, Hurricane Alley, Caribbean. I run a, a adaptation consulting firm called Common Future, and I'm a member of the business group of the Deep Adaptation Forum. We just had a meeting a couple of weeks ago. I see a couple of faces here from that group. So my question, uh, Jem, is you've, you know, you, you've said a couple of times that I've uh, seen you speak in videos and, and, and so forth, that you have not yet uh, taken the time to focus in on how uh, the Deep Adaptation Framework and the four R's apply to business. And it happens to be my own work and i've taken the initiative and i grabbed the 4r framework and i turned it into a uh, uh what i'm calling a deep adaptability framework for business um because the corporate world is is much maligned as as uh, as being part cause of the climate crisis uh, uh but today it's turning its attention to climate risk and um, the UK just uh, announced that it'll be mandating climate risk disclosure by companies. The new Biden administration is coming in with the same uh, uh, intention. Switzerland just announced that it'll be 
uh, mandating companies to uh, disclose and manage their climate risk. And so climate risk has suddenly become, uh, we're in the middle of a tipping point here, right? Uh, and it's forcing companies to do what we are all doing at an individual level, to huddle as senior teams. I'm sorry? I'm, I'm really sorry to wade in, and I've waded in anyway, but I've got quite a few other questions, so I'd really... Okay, so... So a question very, very quickly. Have you uh, thought lately about how the 4R framework and how deep adaptation can be useful in a business setting? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Alex. And it's good you're doing the work. Um, and it's wonderful to hear the framework is, is, is helpful. Um, I'm, I'm, I always love hearing that the, the 4R framework, because that was it, that was what I was offering as a framework for dialogue, because I don't have the answers. This is, a, this is an awful situation for all of us. So um, the, the problem of coming in with a, with a framework would be if it, if it gives the impression that this is just yet another thing, a new management tool and a new, uh, you know, a new thing to get clever at. Um, it's an awful situation for all of us um, and for some people more than others. So I'm, the framework is to invite conversation and it's, it's because I, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, and, and also I've realized that when I, when I have presented uh, ideas on what organizations could do, I've started by saying, so for example, a lecture in Cumbria University, so some business students, I've started with talking about how research on uh, organizations' policies on just simple climate change adaptation are rubbish. I mean, um, it's just not being done properly. Um, and also even just um, adaptation, not deep adaptation, just adaptation to climate change as a framework for investor risk and for, um, guiding um, portfolios and just it's just not being done coherently so just start with that you know just just within the existing paradigm of of, uh, of non-collapse um just so much more could be done on adaptation in general um but then what i've realized is if i don't talk about how how what an awful situation is and bring that um the power of the ideology of being business-like, which I've, you know, as a, I've worked in business school for decades, uh, is, is, is almost like a, it means that people can't even hear what I'm saying, um, doesn't compute. <laughs> and so I realize I, can't, I find it very difficult to just go straight in with a, um, so this is what I think you could be working on and you should need to create a, you need to create a, um, a new role and a new team that reports to the to the board and you need these people on it um uh you know supply chain community relations risk management uh, finance strategy you know and just uh, the the quality of interaction is appalling afterwards people haven't really clocked what i'm talking about so i think you can't sidestep the the full discussion of how difficult it is and how unpredictable the future is becoming and unstable it is and you can't therefore sidestep that what, who you are, Alex, going to meet someone online or in person. You're a person meeting a person who is increasingly mutually vulnerable as are our families and everyone we love and the life that we know more vulnerable. You can't sidestep that. And, to, and no, no, nor should you. Um, and I think that will give a, maybe that then gives a different quality of conversation. Now, I haven't been acting as a consultant on this, so I don't know. But I, my guess is that would give a different quality of conversation. It would become a, quality, a conversation about how do I help my staff and their families uh, and the wider community process this information and work together to work out what to do. Um, so it, would, it wouldn't just be about the organization. It would be a more... Um, a, 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 a sense that the organization is a meeting place of people and it's the people that matter. Um, and I talked about that in my lecture to Bath University where they asked me to talk about organizational implications and I thought well okay I need to talk more about deep adaptation first and then talk about 
ways of raising this with organizations. I don't know if you've seen it, but I'd be really interested in your thoughts on, on what I was recommending. So no, I don't yet have a set of, of, of um, ideas, recommendations, and I will read yours, particularly as I'm, I need to be writing a book this year. Uh, I've committed to that. It'll be coming out in November. And yeah, the organizational implications of this is going to be in the book. So I'll look at your work. Um, Katie, you said there are more questions. And should we have a very quick word from Alex on, on what may, what, what, from that? And then, and then Alex, if you could say very quickly, because then we, we get to the other questions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you, I mean, I, I agree 100% with your uh, feedback on that. I think the reconciliation are, is the starting point in my discussions with corporate groups because it's about people it's about uh connecting and reconciling a corp the, what the strategy the plan they have at a company with this reality so it's about reconciliation of that perception the mindset the human bias that they come to the table with and clearing that out with up first and getting that out of the way before we move into any kind of um you know adaptation agenda so actually it starts with the r with the reconciliation r uh, for exactly the same reason you just stated, yeah. absolutely. But it, it ends up being a people, a yeah. more of an HR kind of people uh, uh, uh -huh. approach to it than because uh, it's going to be so bad and the disruptions are going to be so massive that it's about having that resilient mindset that comes with reconciling, which is what we all try to do on our personal uh, scale. So absolutely. Thank you, Alex. I'll, yeah, I'll send, you, I'll send you a couple of links. Yeah. Also seeing more of what the, the business group in the Deep Adaptation Forum do. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So I was going to invite David Bent to ask his question, but it appears that he's not here, certainly not appearing on the list. So I'm going to ask it on his behalf. Um, how do you think, Jem, that the deep adaptation community can contribute to the big formal processes of 2021, if it can? So he suggests multilateral climate negotiations hosted by the UK, biodiversity by China and UN Food Systems Summit in September. Yeah. Um, so there's a few things he rattled off there i mean i know that there's the the, the, the cop 26 um those of you who are scholars um there's still time to register to review the ipcc report just go to ipcc it's probably ipcc.ch i can't remember off the top of my head and you can register and if you're a scholar then you say who you are and you should be authorized to then uh, be an official reviewer of a chapter or even more if you can do more than one chapter uh, and your feedback will be registered and public and obviously they don't have to take it on board but um yeah do that uh, i am the uh i think the ipcc has had an important role to play but has uh, unfortunately been downplaying uh how dangerous the situation is um by nature of their methodology and the the sort of the permission space they felt they had within as a reporting to an intergovernmental system uh, i'm anticipating what they say in their next assessment report to be way more frightening and uh challenging than anything before so much so we're going to have conversations emerging about geoengineering um, and adaptation will be a lot a bigger conversation and i think um we can't leave it to um physicists to dominate the conversation about what humanity should do because, you know, if you've been trained to wield a hammer, then you'll see every problem as a nail. Um, so yeah, we, I want more scholars involved uh, in conversations about what do we do 
a more transdisciplinary engagement. And that's why I've been involved in something called Scholars Warning to actually pluralize the kinds of uh, people um, involved in, in looking at what do we do about the predicament we're in. Um, more than that, uh, here we go. David, if you watch this, I don't think any of those processes really matter very much. Prove to me they've had any impact whatsoever on the trajectory of the human race over the last decades. Sorry. So we can get all excited and like try and influence one sentence in one report. It doesn't matter. Sorry. And me having worked at the UN for years. <laughs> <laughs> it's sorry carbon emissions biodiversity loss inequality um yeah so um just do what you believe in and don't hold back thank you jim and that was a perfect segue to a question from david baum you there, David. Hello. Nice to see you, Jim. And I'd like to say thank you for your work, for what you've done on behalf of our community and the world. My question is, now that you are less involved in the day-to-day -day work of the forum, how are you spending your time? Oh. Do you know what? It's one of the downsides. I may, I'm, because I'm deliberately spending less time in the forum, like no time <laughs> in the forum, I'm, I'm missing, I'm missing the loveliness of interacting with, it's just gorgeous interacting with people in the forum. And thank you for reminding me that, David. Um, so what am I doing? Um, I was quite involved in the, the, the scholars warning activity so I recommend people go to scholarswarning.net and see what's coming out of that and more's coming later this year. Uh, I've been planning ahead in terms of what intellectual work and research and writing I want to do and securing funding for that and putting a I'll be putting a small team together on that. Um, and I've discovered that I, I can't fix my workaholism through um, uh, I can't fix my workaholism very easily. So what I've done is I've signed up to drumming lessons, singing lessons, and guitar lessons. And so I'm sort of forcing myself to depart from both the intellectual world and also um, just Twitter and looking at world news and the latest oh, that's happening all over the planet, um, particularly in America. And so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to fill up my life with, with more of that. Um, oh, and I've started, I've got a knee and a back problem because I've spent decades working too hard on the laptops, living a story of contribution through self-sacrifice of not looking after my body. And so I'm actually swimming almost a kilometer every other day, which is so damn exhausting because I'm so unfit that actually that wipes me out sometimes. So I haven't fully retired, but I'm trying to get some, <laughs> some balance. <laughs> what are you doing? You are too kind. Uh, nothing relevant to anyone. With respect to deep adaptation, though, the core message that I have learned to take from deep adaptation is to find a life that is authentic to myself and compassionate to others at the same time. That is a struggle learning how to actually benefit people, but also not burn yourself up to ashes in the process. So I'm walking almost every day. That's my version of swimming. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, David.
um, beautiful wisdom to share with us there. Um, I want to um, apologize to anybody who, who posted a question and I haven't invited you to share it. Um, I wanted to, uh, in some areas where there were lots of people posting questions on the same topic, I wanted to get a representation and then some areas which were brand new. So I hope that, um, uh, yeah, even if you posted a question and you didn't hear it, uh, the answer that you have found some answers. Um, but I just wanted to ask Jem before we finish, is there anything that you were expecting to come up or anything that you hoped you might be asked about, which you haven't been asked about yet? Um. Oof. Uh, no, but there's one thing I might want to say, which is um, uh, for those of you who feel ready, it's time to speak out. Um, and uh, that won't and but to do so in in a way where you you re realize that there will be a, that it's it's not easy um, it's not easy because you you obviously want you don't want to be blase callous numb you want to be authentic to yourself and compassionate to the other as david said um, and when you do this speaking out at times it will go wrong or it will be stressful. Um, but I think it is a time now for more people to speak out because um, as the anticipation of disruption and collapse spreads, um, people need to hear that there's this way of responding. And increasing numbers of people are hearing of this way of responding, the deep adaptation way, uh, through the mass media where typically journalists or publishers of books and so on or documentary makers or whatever will be bringing their own agenda where it's completely understandable that they want to make us seem peculiar wrong um, to be laughed at or demonized and that's not going to stop not for quite a while and okay just we can just accept it um, but I think it would be good for more of us to speak out. And that means in whatever ways we can. Um, so that would be my message for those of you who, who can. And to seek support in that perhaps. So the Deep Adaptation Forum, it's various different groups. Um, you know, I mean, now is, is, is there a Facebook group for people who speak out? Is there a Facebook, is there a Facebook group for people who write yeah, as, opinion pieces in your local newspapers or in magazines I don't know but I'm not I'm not directly involved but maybe there could be more support provided beyond the deep adaptation advocates group there could be more support for people to speak out and help each other do that thanks Jem um, we're finishing a little bit early. I would like to thank you so much. This Q&A is a little bit different um, than your previous. And as I understand, this is the last one that you're going to be doing for quite some time. Uh, so it's been uh, really lovely. And thanks to everybody else for coming. And to those of you who have joined for uh, many or several of Jem's Q&As over the last year and a half. I think you've been doing them. Um, yeah. And for those of you that, that we both see in between times, it's a great pleasure. Oh. Jen, thank you very much. Yeah. And just want to say when this, this will go up on my YouTube channel and I'll put some links into like some of the things I said, like, you know, the Oxfam report um, and others. So, um, and then that will be posted to the event page. And if anyone's watching this on YouTube, then um, please, um, 
there are over 50 lovely people on this call and please reach out at the Deep Adaptation Forum, deepadaptation.info, and then you can connect and you can find your place and you can start meeting amazing people around the world and, and um, stay present to the difficulties and be supported and support each other. Thank you. Great. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.